Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have the brilliant Naomi Hansel with us and we're going to be talking about Real Bread Week um, and all the amazing things you can do with dough. So if you've got any questions, pop them in the comments box and we'll get through as many as we can. And hopefully, technology and storm allowing, Nay will pop up any second now. <laughs> Yay, there you are. Hello. Well, not quite you, but almost you. You're <laughs> yes, just, just coming from the other side of the kitchen. How are you this morning, Laura? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yes, I'm good. I'm good. Good. And so we're talking about bread, but specifically real bread week. Um, I know that you've got loads of interesting stuff to say about the difference between real bread and not real bread. So I wondered whether you might explain what happened to bread making over the centuries. Yeah, it's I mean, bread has been around for, you know, as long as time remembered, really. And and it's changed. It has changed a lot. So the bread we have at the moment, it's cheap. It's available. I don't know how many thousands of tons of bread we consume as a country a year, but it's a lot and it's convenient and it's quick. And if you don't have any form of cooking in your home, you can make it make it use a loaf to make a sandwich um and over the years what's happened recently like the industrial processes made bread so the late 18th century and early 19th century they wanted it it became it became sort of um you know the, the wealthy had refined bread and they took out they wanted it white and white bread became a sign of wealth and affluence and all that sort of thing and then, and then in order to mass produce bread, actually, it got very, made very fast. The Chorleywood bread process in the 1940s speeded up bread. And that's where our white loaf sliced loaf came from. But what's happened is a lot of the nutrition and the goodness has come out of it. Um, and if it's going to be your staple, you consume a lot of, it's surely much better to have lots of goodness in it too. Um, so that's, so that, that's the thing. So the thing is about better. Why not make our bread that we eat every day? better how can we make it better how can we do it differently how can we make it ourselves and it's a coming together thing as well you know there's nothing like making bread for you and your family there's nothing like breaking bread to give to somebody and there's a lot of the purpose of a lot of the community bakeries that's um, springing up all over the country is about getting together to make bread um, so there's a lot going on in bread actually so we'll just but you know today let's let's make some and let's hopefully show how easy it is to make delicious bread of your own yeah, you're about to show us how to make a really simple loaf, aren't you? Which I'm super excited about because I love bread. I know that smell, that smell of a piece of toast and all those sorts of delicious things. And there's so many quick and easy things we can do with bread on the Arga once you've made it. But let's, as you say, let's make a loaf. I've done quite a few steps in advance. I've done quite a few steps in advance, hopefully show you quite speedily how to do it and what to do with your dough once you've got it. So, yeah, so let's let me tell you everything I know about bread and how to make it quickly and easily. Um, so it's hardly any ingredients. Water and yeast or something to make it rise and flour to give it its body and then salt. Really, that's all of it. You can put lots of other things in, which I'm sure Laura and I will talk about in a little while, but let's, let's make it really simply. So we'll start with number one. So take some water and put your yeast in it. And I've used today, I'm using for my quick, quick everyday bread, which I make and takes about maybe an hour and a half altogether to make. I would use this like a dried yeast. Um, it's got, uh, it, it's got a cap on it, it's in a tin. It lasts forever in the cupboard. Um, eventually it'll run out of date. And sometimes you might make a loaf of bread that you've used with yeast from the cupboard, but it should probably be fine, but sometimes it might not be. But so take, so I've got um, 300 mils of water, uh, 300 grams of water. I always weigh the water actually for bread making, get on much better if your measurements are in, all in the same weight. Um, and then a teaspoon of my dried yeast. And I've had that sat on the back of the agar actually. So yeast needs heat to start to get going. So if you put the yeast into the water in a warm place or put it into warm water, it will work quite quickly. If it's in cold water, it'll take much longer to start working. So we tend to just pop it on the back of the agar while I'm getting my other bits and pieces ready. And in five or 10 minutes, it's all nice and warm and ready to go. And you'll see it start to froth a bit. You get this kind of frothy mixture and it'll start to smell yeasty. So then take, for today, I've got 500 grams of flour. 
And I've got, you want bread flour, so it's got to be strong flour. And the reason it's strong is it's got lots of gluten in it and you need lots of gluten in your bread flour because that's where the stretch comes from. So take the flour, you want bread flour either, and buy good flour, this is where it starts. If you buy super refined, I've got white flour today, which is really refined. But at this point you could add in some wholemeal flour. So definitely, you know, get your flour from somewhere good. And lo you know, local the better, find out where it's grown if you can, find out where it's, how it's been milled. There's a lot going on in the world of flour at the moment. So take your flour, 300 grams of flour. I'm going to add a teaspoon of salt. Um, I think the, one of the reasons that homemade bread can often taste a little disappointing is because it doesn't have enough salt in it. So, um, and then we're using hands to mix, actually. Your hands are definitely your best implements for bread making. Take your uh, liquid mixture, pour it in, and then just mix it together. You could use a spoon to start with if you like, because it's kind of wet. Just get it to come together. Um, th this is the sort of thing bread flour benefits a bit from being abandoned actually as well. So if you you could just sort of give it a little bit of a mix, then you could wander off and go and do something else. That should come together. <laughs> you know, sometimes you might think this just doesn't feel quite right, and often it's probably because your measurements aren't quite right. So mine is a little bit wet at the moment, in spite of having measured carefully, so I'll put some more flour in it um, just to get it to come together. So step number one is you're mixing, starting your, starting your yeast, you're mixing. Step number two will be kneading, which we'll show you very shortly. Let's just pop a bit more flour in here. And flour, handling dough and flour and things can be a little bit uncomfortable, actually. You know, you, you, you might constantly feel like you want your hands to be um, not sticky, but you'll get used to the stickiness, I would say. We'll pop the recipes that I'm using today up onto, um, I don't know where Georgia puts them, actually. Maybe she puts them into the, onto the Facebook page so you can find them. Some of the recipes I'm going to talk about today are already um, on the Arga Living website, and there are all lots of good bread recipes on there too. There we go. So once you've got your dough, so at this point, rub whatever dough you've got on your fingers off, give them a little wash, and just let, 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 let that stand for a moment or two. The gluten in the flour will start working even before you've done too much mixing to it. There we go. So let's do a bit of kneading. So there's two ways of doing kneading. You can either dust your worktop with flour, but often you can use water as well. My dough's still quite wet for some reason. Maybe I've done one of those weird things of half the quantities of some of the ingredients and not the rest. Slightly strange. Um, your dough might be quite firm, it might be quite wet like this. Wet, wet doughs are brilliant, the wetter the better, to be honest, um, because it's going to give you more holes in your bread. Um, and different recipes might have different amounts of water, different consistencies. I'll just get this. I think I probably have done that half quantity thing where I put in more water than actually the recipe needed. So there we go. So once you get your bread starting to hold its shape a bit, we can give it a knead. Um, so the kneading, all you want to do with the kneading is stretching it. That's, you don't really have to pummel it too much, but I tend to do this action where you just push away, stretch away and fold back and stretch and fold. And that's how I would need this. And actually, I would need this like this for 10 minutes. I'd put the radio on. I might put, set a timer. Um, and that's going to give me a really nice springy dough. You can see already it's gone from being a bit raggy to being quite a nice ball shape. Um, and actually, you know once it's had enough kneading, if when you give it a little poke, 
it doesn't it, it it's it doesn't spring it springs back completely so give it a little poke and you'll feel it because it'll feel really nice and springy in your hands it will be ready to go so then once you've got your kneaded dough now um oh, we'll talk about alternatives to kneading by hand actually in a minute or two so that's your kneading by hand 10 minutes 15 minutes it's wholemeal flour it just needs more work but 10 minutes for a standard standard loaf and that will be fine so once you've got your loaf and it's all been kneaded you want to leave it to prove and that's where sort of the magic happens a bit so you can prove it put it into a bowl and put it cover it um and then put it somewhere nice and warm and we've got the best warm place all together in the kitchen with the agar because you've got the agar so take leave your dough and have it warming either like on a shelf up here or it could stand on your simmering plate lid protect your simmering plate with a chef's pad or with a tea towel but the heat of the simmering plate will be perfect so then take your dough and let me show you this because i've covered this cover it with a tea towel or with a piece of cling film or um beeswax wrap or something if it's not somewhere too warm or one of these um hotel shower caps which are quite handy but here's the dough and you want it to be you want it to rise and it's double in size that's the, that's the thing to listen for so rice and it's double in size i put some olive oil into the bottom of the bowl that just helps it come out um, and now all i need to do is to turn it out and we're going to shape it and it feels lovely it's slightly warm it's springy it's really puffy and lovely and it's quite relaxed and floppy now let me get my tool that i need for this let me get a knife so what i want to do i'm going to show you some things to do with different um different ways to do with the same dough. This is just a standard dough. Um, so take two thirds of the quantity. So I have, let's tidy up. Um, I've taken, so this is this is one and a half times the quantity because we need to want to do lots of things with it. So I have, take, take two thirds of the loaf. I'm just gonna shape it and you can see how it's really floppy. And what I want it to happen, I want it to, to just spring into a bit of a ball. So give it a little bit more of a knead. So this stretch and pull, and what happens, this activates the gluten. So, and the gluten makes it go all tight again, which gives it its shape. And we want it to have a bit of shape like this, because when it goes into the oven, it's gonna rise. And what we, this is what we call the gluten cloak. And that's the outside of the loaf that gives it its shape. So give it a little knead, and I'm just folding it inside. I'm gonna shape it into a little bit of a, a sort of an, like an, Rect, not exactly a rectangle, but it's sort of that shape, longish sort of loaf. Then put it onto a baking tray. And the best one we have in the Arga world is the cold plain shelf. Um, you want to flour that a little bit. I've lined mine with a piece of bake oat lide. There we go. Line this with a piece of bake oat lide. Um, you can put a bit of flour onto it if you want to as well. Or the other thing which is brilliant for bread making is some polenta, this sort of coarse grain polenta, and it works like marbles. We use it for lining. We put it onto the pizza paddle before we slide pizzas directly onto the floor of the oven. Um, it's brilliant for any sort of bread because it's going to be a really good way of just making sure your bread doesn't get stuck to anything you're baking it on. Good. So take a tea towel and cover it. And we're gonna give that a second proof. Now there's quite a lot of loaves and to be honest, there's quite a lot of times when I would just put that straight in the oven and bake it. But today, because we've got a little bit of time, we can set that aside again, we can let it prove for another maybe half an hour or so. Um, and it would then we, then we can bake it. And once it's done its rising bit, say half an hour later, it's gonna look like that. So we're not aiming for a beautiful kind of bakery style loaf today, we're just aiming for an everyday, simple as you like bread so this has risen a bit it's relaxed a bit i'm going to sprinkle it with flour i'm going to score it with a sharp knife these are these baker's lames they use they're really sharp they're just like a razor blade and a holder but a sharp knife will be fine and then score it so this is what you call your baker's signature and this is where people do those beautiful pictures on their sourdoughs or their flours but just you need to create some form of gap so that the bread has got somewhere to expand otherwise it will it will rise unevenly and it will sort of tear so but i've just got little stripes at the moment so that's ready for the oven baking the agar in the in baking <laughs> baking bread in the agar 
totally brilliant actually because you've got the best bread oven in the world it's got this really intense heat from the cast iron it's using radiant heat to cook so it's cooking it on the outside to give it a beautiful crust it's also cooking right into the bread in the middle so we're not just forcing hot air at it and we're not just blowing fan air at the outside we're cooking it all the way through so you get loaves that cook all the way through really nicely um, so you don't need to there's lots of things you don't really need to do actually we can just then slide this straight in use the roasting oven it's the hottest oven put it on maybe the second or third set of runners maybe the fourth set of runners depends on how you feel somewhere in the middle set a timer for half an hour probably for a loaf like that and then it might well take another 10 minutes so that's my standard loaf right let's do a few other things with this I should try and have a little tidy up my workshop um so let what else should we do with this let's take let's do some little rolls and some knots because you don't always want a whole loaf do you um if you make a whole loaf and there's only one or two of you you can cut it into half and cut it into quarters and freeze the bits you don't need that's quite good to do and then take your quarter loaf out pop it into the warming oven or sit it on the top of the agar um, on the simmering plate lid to defrost and then you've got instant bread but you might want to just make a few rolls instead so let's do three of these and then you might want to do maybe a few dough balls as well let's do those keep a look at it back for dough balls so rolls are fun actually you can either do the rolly ones like the bakers do <laughs> so use your um squash the dough flat on your hand don't don't flour the worktop for this actually it won't really like it just um squash it flat and then press down into the worktop and use your your thumb joint to just gently encourage it off the worktop and then cup your fingers and it will shape into a really nice little ball and the really speedy bakers can do two hands at once which is really clever to do my brain isn't wired like that so little rolls are nice to do and leave those there we can see them um we might do something like some knots these are good to do so just again on a worktop that's not exactly floured mine's got a little bit of oil on it still which is fine roll it into a sausage about the width of both hands um roll them in roll the sausage into some flour actually it makes it a whole lot easier then just tie it into a knot like that and do another one so roll it into the width of both hands you can see how bre how easy breadsticks would be as well you could just then sprinkle them with something and brush them with olive oil and sprinkle them with herbs and salt put them in the oven so there's my little knots um right let's put those in the oven so once so again let them warm let them prove for a bit and when they're proved like that they're then ready for the oven we'll pop those on a baking sheet shortly pop them in the oven as well when they come out actually i've got some in the oven i can show you you'll get these lovely knot shapes like these so these ones this is a whole batch i prepared earlier half of them i floured and half of them i just um brush with a little bit of beaten egg and sprinkled with some fennel seeds and they've got some tomato puree in, um, in there as well let's just put the one there there we go we can use that tray we'll pop these ones there's quite a lot of logistics in managing lots of bread this morning let's put these ones that i've proved a little bit rolls like this you know you can just often put them straight into the oven to bake you don't necessarily have to wait for them to prove these ones i'll pop these in this one um so i'm going to bake these in my baking oven only really because uh, my other loaf is in the roasting oven at the moment my baking oven is still actually really nice and hot um, i'm cooking on the r3 today and it's got a setting that lets you have the top oven as your hot oven, your roasting oven, and the bottom oven as a baking oven. So if you're doing lots of baking, it's really good to do. Oh. So let me just, while those are baking, let's just do what I love to do, actually, and my children love to do as well, which are just some little knots. Just going to straighten my camera. And not the knots, sorry, some little dough balls. So take maybe a walnut sized piece of dough, not very big at all necessarily. And this is good because then a, a, a whole batch of dough would make loads of these. 
and they're just you're going to use the same technique as the rolls so all my little bits of dough and again just squash them flat and roll them up into a little dough ball And these are going to bake in about five minutes. We'll cook them in the roasting oven. We'll just slide them in somewhere around the loaf that's in there. You could do, um, you could stuff them with things. This is nice to do. So if you have them slightly bigger, you could take a little square of mozzarella cheese and you could put it in there and you could fold it around, carefully roll it into a ball like that and bake those inside. Um, that would be fun to do. Well, I might be able to use two hands to do these, but great to do. The good thing with dough, actually, and on Friday, if anybody's at home today thinking, what am I going to do today? It's a howling gale outside and we're on half term. What should we do? You know, do bread because with bread, the more you work it, the better it gets. So even with little children, it's totally brilliant to do. Right. Let's bake those on a baking tray. These are super handy, the trays. The, um, this is a, one of the enameled trio set. We use the deep one for roast potatoes. I use the medium sized one for making brownies, tray bits in. I use the shallow one for sort of anything that has to go in the oven. And they're brilliant because they take the really intense heat of the agar, which is what you need. You don't want to buy things that are going to buckle on you. Right. Oh, that's so exciting in there. Let's just put those in. I'll put them underneath there, they'll be fine. Remember, if you put things in underneath the tray, underneath the cold plane shelf, it'll shield the heat from them a bit. If you put them at the top near the ovens, that's the hottest part where you do really intense hot cooking um, and grilling right at the top. You know, we grill at the top, roast right in the middle, and we can cook it directly on the floor. Um, so I've got, so we've cooked some knots already. I've got some knots and some rolls in the baking oven. I've got um, my loaf, my beautiful loaf, which is going to be lovely, my beautiful everyday loaf in the roasting oven. I've got my dough balls underneath. Um, I've got one more bit of bread. I'm going to show you which we're going to cook on the top, actually. But I might come back to Laura now and just see if you have any questions, um, see if we have anything else we want to talk about bread, and then I'll do flatbreads on the top. Hello. Well, that was very lovely, and I am very hungry. Um, we have some <laughs> questions. Um, Jenny has said, would you ever use a stand mixer with a dough hook to do the bread? Yes, right. Let's talk about making it all easier because there are days when it's lovely to stand for 10 minutes and it's very good for your pelvic floor. Actually, students stand and do some good kneading. But there are days when actually you just want bread and you don't want to have to wait. So, yes, use a mechanical alternative. So you might have a hand mixer that has the, those twirly beaters. They're your, they're your dough hooks. So you can stand and you could use those to do your dough, do your kneading, give it 10 minutes. You can use a stand mixer. Yes, the dough hook, that funny curly one. Um, you give it 10 minutes exactly the same. Um, you will find that you need to do it on the slowest speed on your mixer and just keep an eye on your mixer in case it tries to walk off the side of the worktop. Um, or if you've got something like a food processor with a dough setting, um, a Thermomix or something like that, they are genius for bread actually and will knead in about two minutes. So yes, you know, really, I, and that's that's lets you spend the fun time, let's spend your time doing the fun bits shaping the dough and flavoring it and how to make it creative um if you don't always want to be stand there kneading perfect brilliant and julia has said is it possible to cook bread in the baking oven too yes so the thing with the with the oven so your roasting oven is the hottest it's normally around 220 degrees approximately it might be hotter or colder depending on what else is going on but it's around that level then your baking oven is cooler and it's normally about 190, 180, 190, 200, that sort of temperature. So we use the roasting oven for cooking breads um, and dishes that don't have much sugar in them, actually. So scones, breads, pizzas, shoe pastry, um, normal short crust pastry directly on the floor of the oven. But we use the baking oven for things that generally have a bit more sugar because it's not quite so hot. And if you put if you cook a very sweet bread like a brioche or Chelsea buns or cinnamon rolls, those things that have some sugar in the dough, you want a bit of a cooler heat. So, yes, use the baking oven. Um, the owners of the new ER7s have a real treat because they can vary the temperature on their roasting oven. So if you have an ER7 and you're baking brioche, cinnamon rolls, those sorts of things, use maybe R6 
um, or R7, your standard roasting oven temperature is R8 on those cookers. Use one of the slightly cooler settings just to take the edge off the heat. It can give you more like 200 degrees instead of um, 220. Some recipes will say, start it off in a conventional cooker. They'll say, start your, start your bread off in your oven, turn it as hot as possible to about 240, and then turn it down once the bread is in the oven. And actually, if you've only got a roasting oven, that's slightly trickier to achieve. So all you do is either you can start it off at the highest point in the oven and then you can move it down. That will lower the temperature a bit. You can start off at the highest point of the oven, lower it down, and then you can put the cold plain shelf above because remember that works as a heat shield, um, a bit like we have at the moment. It'll be shielding the dough balls a little bit. Not that I want it to, but that will be fine. We'll give them a bit longer. But you can shield the heat that way to give you temperature um, control effectively in your oven. Brilliant. That is fantastic. Um, Jenny has just asked for a good pizza base recipe. Um, but I should tell you, Penny, that I'm oh, sorry, Jenny, that it runs, that we did a pizza um, Instagram live with Penny um, last week. So if you go onto Instagram, there's everything you need to know about cooking pizza in your arga over there. Um, I have some questions that have come in advance. Um, can you make bread without kneading it? Yes, because often, again, it's like, I haven't got time to do it. So the way the gluten, so developing the gluten, we knead the dough, we do that stretching to develop the gluten. And the gluten is what gives us the stretch, which means when the bread goes into the oven, all the water inside that bread turns into steam and it goes poof and it rises. And the stretcher your bread is, the better the rise you'll get as the water turns into steam. That is how bread making works. That's why the intense heat of the Arga cast iron ovens are so brilliant because you put the bread in, it goes poof, and the water explodes into steam and you get this beautiful rise. Um, so gluten can be developed two ways. One is moving, one is by mechanical stretching, but the other is with time. So if you just mix together the flour and the water with the yeast and the salt in it, um, mix it together so there's no dry patches and leave it. Walk away for 20 minutes, come back. The gluten will have done a bit of its work already. And then we might give it a little, so you can do what we call the no knead method. So just give it four little folds in the bowl and then cover it and walk away and leave it again for 10 or 20 minutes. And again, that, that time will do the same job as kneading, which I think is a whole lot easier, isn't it? And that's, that's the method we use to make sourdough because you want time to help. A, your... Um, your yeast, your rising is quite delicate because it's your natural yeast. Your starter is just your natural rising agent. Um, and also the time gives it a bit of flavor. So yeah, no need, just, just let time do the work instead. Give it four little folds, four times over the course of an hour. Then you'll have a, 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 a loaf that's ready to shape and then just put it on the top of the argo, let it prove, pop it in the oven and bake it. Brilliant. Victoria has asked, do you think it's a good or bad idea to put water in your roasting oven to create steam? You don't need to with the aga. There's lots of things. You know, it's a bit like when we come to roast chicken. So con conventional recipes and website tell us to cover things with foil and to baste them and to cook them upside down. And none of that we have to do with the aga. You just put your joint into your aga and it roasts it beautifully. Because the heat, because the radiant heat's cooking differently to normal cookers, it's not moving. And similarly, because you have this really intense heat, I certainly find that you don't need to be throwing ice cubes on the bottom of the roasting oven or you don't need to be putting like managing trays of water around the kitchen you know that's all just too hard just put it in you've got enough water inside your bread that's going to turn into steam quick enough and develop a beautiful crust without needing to add any more and the arg is great for baking bread isn't it i don't know what it is about it yeah i'm sure you do know what it is about it but there's something about <laughs> bread that's better yeah the thing is it's it's one of those things it just it all it's all just easier so it's easy to just put the water and the yeast on the top of the back for a few minutes to warm up i haven't got to worry about what temperature was that water at before i before i put the yeast in just put it on the back and let it and once it's frothy it's ready to go um and you've always got a warm place to prove the bread because you can put it on the simmering plate lid or you can put it sort of next to it or on a shelf so it could just sit there quietly and the is working even if none of the doors or the lids are open um, and then and then because your ovens are on, you're ready to bake. So actually I've got, so this is the R3 where I tend to have the ovens on um, E setting and then I turn them up to cook, which takes about an hour and I turn them down again at night. And that's just so easy to run. Um, but then on the other side of the kitchen here, I've got an ER3 and it has a roasting oven that takes an hour to heat up. Well, if I come down in the morning, I tend to turn that one off at night, turn a hot oven off at night because I don't need the heat build up in the kitchen. I just have it on all day for cooking with. 
So I turn it on in the morning, I make my bread dough, and the time it takes the oven to heat up, which is an hour, then my dough is risen and ready to go. And off we go. So even if you have an on-off controllable lager, you've still got an lager that's ready to make your bread exactly when you need it. Exactly, perfect. Victoria's also added, um, do you bake bread on the floor of your oven? oven? Yes, I do. And actually, I would have done today, actually. I don't know why I didn't. So if you're making a, a, like a beautiful big ciabatta, so those sorts of ciabattas and catches and those sorts of things, generally, they're exactly the same ingredients. They're flour and water and yeast and salt, but they just tend to be a whole lot more water. So they tend to be a very runny dough. And with um, ciabatta dough, it literally just, you, you, you rise it and then you sort of pour it over the worktop. And actually, funnily enough, with not too much stretching, the gluten then activates and it brings it back and you can shape it you'll end up with quite a floppy dough. So they're brilliant to cook on the floor because all you do is take your bit, like a piece of thin piece of wood or something or a baker's pad or something like that, it's brilliant. Um, or even just a chopping board or the cold plane shelf um, upside down so the lip doesn't catch. Put some polenta on it, which is like your marbles so that you can slide it off easily. And then slide your dough, slide your bread dough straight onto the floor of your roasting oven. Give it maybe five or 10 minutes directly on the floor and then I would move it onto a shelf to carry on cooking because the floor of the oven is quite an intense heat to do the whole of the cooking on it. I would be moving it up. Um, but we do pizzas like that on the floor all the time, both ready-made and and the lovely sort of um, homemade ones like Penny Made. Brilliant, that's perfect. Um, I've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, so if there's anything you want to ask, pop it in the question box now. Um, and Nay, um, I have a question. Is there such a thing yeah. as a low carb bread? Um, so it depends on why you want low carb. Um, so refi really refined white bread, when we eat it, gets turned, the starch gets turned into sugars really quickly. Um, in our bodies and gives us quite a fast energy release. So often we want slower release energy because we want our blood sugar level to be able to manage it better. We want our body to release enough insulin at the right time to just keep that all nice and gentle. So we often want slower release bread. So that is, that's the re that's often why people want a low carb because, and the way to, the way to lower the carb and slow down the release of your bread, the release of the sugars into your bloodstream is just to put more stuff in. So wholemeal, seeds, nuts, more fiber. So that's, that's sort of the thing with the very refined white flours is that there's not much fiber in there. There's not much to slow down the release and nor is there much in the way of vitamins or minerals. Although lots of breads now have all the vitamins and minerals added back in, don't they? Yeah. So, so low carb breads tend to be the ones with actually less, lots of other stuff in them. So lots of ground seeds, um, that would be lovely. And or rye flour, you know, things like those beautiful dark German rye breads, they tend to just have a slower, they have a, they have a different kind of carb. They just have a slower release carb. Brilliant. Um, Sue's asked, how do you bake bread on the base of an ER3? I um, thought you should always use the grid in, on this oven. Yes. Okay. So on the ER3, I tend to find that I use the floor grid for cooking most things, actually. But if you only want to give something a few minutes to start, all you want to do is develop the crust of the bottom of your bread. So on, on an ER3, five minutes to start with and then move it onto a shelf. Yeah. Um, you can cook. I mean, you're safe. You're totally safe to cook. You're safe to put pans and griddles and all that sort of thing on the floor of your roasting oven in your ER3. It's just quite an intense heat. So if you're cooking things for longer, if I'm cooking a pastry tart without blind baking on the floor of my oven in my ER3, I would. It's going to take more than 15 minutes or so. So I would definitely put my floor grid in at the start. And a little bit is trial and error. You know, the worst that can happen is you're going to overcook something. So feel free, you know they're your cookers and they're made of cast iron you can't break them so um but yeah it's just you said yeah. the wrong thing sorry nay i think i might have said the wrong thing um but I, it's very stormy here it's like distracted by <laughs> it sounds like the windows are wrapped up um I, i'm not sure whether i said er3 or er7 but sue said er7 okay yes so in the r7 Yep. The ER7 yeah. is slightly more forgiving, do you know? So the ER7, if anybody's wondering about the difference, what is the difference and what is the story with all these new arguments, your ER7 is a completely cast iron cooker. 
Um, all of the ovens are completely cast iron. And on the ER7, I would cook on the floor of the roasting oven. I would put my pizzas in directly on the floor, five or 10 minutes, totally fine. They're gonna cook beautifully. If I'm cooking for longer than 20 minutes, and actually sometimes if it's a quiche that's gonna cook quite quickly, I might cook it without the floor grid. You've got the floor grid there for cooking for longer periods of time on the bottom, maybe like 15, 20 minutes, half an hour or longer. Uh, the ER3, again, but use the floor grid for like 15 minutes, definitely. There's a, there's a bit less leeway on the ER3 is what I found cooking on both of them quite regularly. Brilliant. Thank you. Nay, you have ever, as ever, have been totally wonderful. You've been a really great audience. Thank you so much. Um, we've got loads more lives planned. We've got Mother's Day brunch. We've got pancakes. We've got pies. We've got all sorts of things. So do keep coming back to see what's going on. Um, and Nay, where can people follow you? So on Instagram, Nay Hansel underscore inspiring cooking. Um, I might, if we've got a minute or two, I can just show you the finished result of a few oh, things, if you like, actually. Um, because our bread can come out of the oven shortly. I'll show you this. But I just want to, so often we, sometimes we get, you know, we get, we have our loaf of bread and we think that's sort of it. But, you know, there's a million ways to use things, aren't there? My dough balls are done. So they are finished. Oh, they look great. Um, so the dough balls, so the easiest thing to do with the dough balls is to take, take some nice garlic butter, some nice herby garlic butter, um, and then pop it in a little dish on the back of the agar, it will melt. And then there's my dough balls ready just to dip in there. If I bake them on a baking tray and bake them all really close together, you get tear and share bread. What we tend to do there is, if, or if I stuff them with mozzarella, we might then cook them all close together so, they, so you do a tear and share. But when you come out the oven, just pour the garlic butter over the top so it seeps into all the gaps. And then you've got mozzarella stuffed garlic dripping, delicious, deliciousness. And just serve that warm from the oven, really, really nice. Um, I've got, so my knots, remember my little fennel knots in both versions, actually we'll have some of these. So these sorts of things are lovely just to take and they look pretty, whether they're knots or rolls. Um, and you know what is really good to just serve? You might pass these around sort of as part of a selection of dishes, uh, but just take some olive oil, people dip them in olive and balsamic they're the two nice together you put them into the same dish and i love the way the balsamic always drops to the bottom of the dish with olive oil so you dip all the way down to get a little bit of both um but then serve it this is something this is called some duca this is like a little hazelnut um roasted hazelnut and black peppercorn sort of spiced nutty thing that you can just break your bread then dip into one and then the other that's a delicious thing to do um, and the other thing I did with some knots earlier on was I sliced a few together and just made a few bruschetta. So take your baking tray, drizzle your slices of bread with a little bit of olive oil into the oven, five minutes, turn them over. They might need another five minutes or they might not. And then you can just take your little bruschetta. You would want to rub them with a clove of garlic. You've got one handy. And these are the, this is the sort, these are kind of your like stand up starters, kitchen nibbles you know, what you do when actually supper's not quite ready and everyone's just sitting there looking starving, aren't they? So honestly, take a piece of bread, slice it up, throw it in the oven for five minutes. In the meantime, chop some tomatoes. And at this time of year, they probably need a bit of a helping hand. They definitely need some salt, some nice olive oil, some black pepper, and actually maybe a pinch of sugar because they're a bit starved of daylight at this time of year. So, and keep definitely the juices as well. So then just heap a few little tomatoes onto your bread. In the summer, this is dead easy because a few tomatoes out of the garden will taste fabulous, won't they? But black pepper. And then you might sprinkle on some basil or some tarragon or some herb of some sort. Oh, really good. There we go. But see, how easy is that? So don't, you know, don't limit yourself just to toasties, sandwiches, those sorts of things. Um, so let me just move these. And then finally, let me show you my loaf because that will now come out along with my ear pop. If I move that that way, I've still got a very flowery worktop today. We're not being that tidy. That's my dough balls. Put those there. Um, I'll tell you what, it is jolly handy to have decent set of oven gloves when you're doing bread because otherwise everything is so hot. And there is my loaf. Oh, wow. That's so, amazing. 
And even though it started off as a fairly sort of floppy shape, you can see how it's just lifted itself up. And it doesn't matter that it's a bit sort of, you know, free form and wonky because it was quick and speedy to make. Um, don't forget, you've got the best cooling rack in the world because you've got your Arga toaster. Of so we course, always use that yeah. cooling bread. That's other thing. See, things life is just kind of simple. So just cool it down. Um, I've got a few flatbreads we did on the tops. I've turned my tops off actually to use the falling heat on that so they've not cooked so quickly, but they will be quite nice too. Um, and then finally, I've got two more things to show you because I've been so busy bread wise, but this is the cutest thing. So if you didn't want to free form your loaf like that and you wanted a bit more of a uniform shape, you can cook bread. Obviously you can use a nice Arga loaf tin, um, but you can also use a pan. So I've got a little loaf I've made in this, the little beautiful cast iron 16 centimeter saucepan. Um, and I just put it in there, let it bake. And I've got this beautiful mini, mini loaf, which is great when you don't want lots, isn't it? That was a third of the dough quantity. So I used two thirds to make my big loaf and a third to make my little one. But I think it's, that's the cutest thing I've that's seen adorable. for a long time. I'll take a picture and George, you might put it on Instagram. Um, there we go. I've got, I have got one more thing. Shall I show oh, you it on my Yeah, Do, yeah. Wow, you've been really busy. <laughs> Well, the thing is, not being funny, but lots of things. So all of these will go into the freezer. Bread freezes so brilliantly. So have a bread fest and make lots and then just freeze the bits you don't need or freeze some of them. This is a fruit loaf. This is a raisin and cranberry and mm. walnut, pecan nut, something like that loaf. It's got quite a lot of wholemeal flour in it. It's got malt extract. It's got lots of goodness. It's really nice. And I love that either two ways. Slice really, really thinly and toast it on the simmering plate. And then I have it with cheese as those really thin little kind of crackers almost, because they cost a fortune to buy in the shop, whereas this is really cheap to make. Or the other way I have it is actually with a cup of tea in the afternoon and I just butter it really thickly. And that I find delicious. I love the savouriness of the walnuts to go with the fruit. And you can use any combination of fruit and nuts that you've got in the cupboard, but that's a really nice, that recipe's up on the Arbor Living website already. Um, oh, so handy. Yeah, that's great. Georgie, perhaps um, you could post a link um, in um, the um, comments so that we can all bake it because I think um, that Jane wants to come around for lunch. I think we should all pop around here. <laughs> We should um and jenny's asked for the recipe and i definitely want to bake that so yes that's very yeah. exciting yeah oh no you, as ever you've been amazing you are just a goddess in the kitchen and that is <laughs> absolutely delicious and thank you so much you've been great you've been a lovely audience thank you everyone and thank you to the brilliant georgie who um is a technical whiz perfect nice to see you all. <laughs>